Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you all again. I'd like to introduce Janine Olson. Janine Olson is an artist whose practice incorporates interdisciplinary uses of photography, performance, film, video, and installation work. She's exhibited at the New Museum of Contemporary Art last year, at Exit Art here in New York, at Beta Local in San Juan, Puerto Rico, at X Initiative here in New York, Grand Arts in Kansas City, Socrates Sculpture Park over in Queens in Long Island City, uh, LACE, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, Samson Projects in Boston, John Connolly Presents in New York, an excellent little gallery that is now unfortunately defunct, um, the Kansas City Museum of Art, Participant Inc. here in New York, and MoMA PS1. <laughs> and also Pump House Gallery in London, White Columns here in New York, and Art in General. Janine has received several grants, including Franklin Furness, the Jerome Foundation, the Brooklyn Arts Council, and the College Art Association. And she's also done residencies at Skowhegan and Smack Mellon in Brooklyn. Janine is an assistant professor of photography in the Department of Art, Media, and Technology at Parsons, and she attended the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and Rutgers. Please join me in welcoming Janine Olson. Thank you, Mark. Um, I am going to try to keep this really interesting and not too long. Um, I forgot that I also got a Creative Capital grant. That's really exciting that I have not, don't have my bio yet, but that's really exciting for me. Um, I needed to update it. Um, Basically, I'm going to go, I'm doing a chronological drag through um, from the recent past into somewhat of the present or the, re the very recent past. And, um, and I can't talk about everything. There's things missing like uh, unicorn fences, uh, images for people being held in solitary confinement. If you're interested in that, ask me about it later. Um, oh. Ronald Reagan's natal chart as a sand painting. There's so many things that I'm, are missing from this talk, but I'm just going to go with the flow of what made sense um, in this amount of time. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is a project I did in 2008, um, and it was called the Greater New York Smudge Cleanse. And um, I, spent, I spent a lot of time in New Mexico and uh, with my girlfriend or family, and. And I, I grew up in Oregon, so I'm used to I'm used to kind of hippie New Age culture. But I realize that actually it does not have as much money as it does in New Mexico, and it's not as sort of concentrated. And after being there, I, it kind of drove me somewhat crazy. And and the sort of overload of um, like cultural co-optation. So I thought that I, I had this impulse to make the world's largest sage smudge stick, sort of a supersized version. And I was thinking like, well. In some way, this is um, this is a, a means of of making an object that kind of points to uh, a weirdness that's happening in our culture these days, and so I made it. But then I was like, well, what do I do with this object because it's meant to be used? And and smudging is the act of burning. And in this case, it's a uh, in the Southwest. Um, in many, uh, well, actually, in, in many sort of pre Christian, Judeo Christian, or pre monotheistic cultures, um, the idea of bundling herbs and burning them often, like that, that act is about uh, a cleansing. So, in this case, in the Southwest, um, traditionally, burning sage is a way to collect bad energy and sort of dissipate it to another realm, um, which we need a lot of. I would say. And so I live in New York, though, and I was like, well, I, I'd actually like to do something specific to New York. And I set up this series of events um, in four different places in New York. Uh, so one, and I sort of thought of it as a traveling, cleansing ritual um, throughout New York. The first was in Greenpoint around the um, oil spill. The second was in Gowanus Canal, uh, naturally about the sort of devastatingly polluted water there. Um, the Manhattan's West Village on the piers, um, sort of the way that queer communities and communities of color or 
poverty has been driven out of the West Villages with, with West Village with gentrification. And then um, the last was the day before the US or the um, 2008 election. So I was thinking a lot about um, what, what's happening in terms of the economic collapse and also what president is coming in. Um, so after I made the stick, I, <laughs> I submitted to the Guinness Book of World's Records, um, <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> which uh, they never got back to me because actually you have to pay them to do anything. So, um, but this is the, the first event in Greenpoint, and this is at the Newtown Creek, which is an incredibly polluted waterway, but one of the reasons it's polluted is that there is an oil spill underneath Greenpoint that is still sitting there because no one will, exact, will take, or take a responsibility for it. But at this point, the D, um, DA is actually, there, it's a super fun site, so that's good. That's happened in the past four years, I believe. Um, but it's, I think, between 15 and 30 million gallons of crude oil sitting underneath that neighborhood. And at the time, I was living there. And people who have lived there have very odd cancers. Um, and all of these things can be explained by the fact that they're sitting on top of um, what is pretty much known as an Exxon Mobil oil spill. So. Um, here's an image of it, a map, and this was from one of the handouts that went to um, that went to people who were interested in the project, or like as we sort of had a procession around the edges of the spill. This is the other side of the flyer. Smudging, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, it was an interesting project in one way because I was thinking a lot about public art and um, community, or sort of what it means to sort of enact, act, enact a creative project in a public space, and who is it for? Do they want what you're giving them? <laughs> um, and what are they bringing to it, and how are they kind of interacting with the, the idea? So in this case, I thought like I'm going to make this a really absurd project that in its heart has some desire to actually change and modify a situation. Um, some people came, some people thought it was extremely funny uh, and um, snarky. Other people came to it very spiritually. Um, other people had no idea what was happening. Um, and it was really, so we would eventually kind of gather, it would be a lot of friends who were there and then sometimes we would gather other people as we sort of walked um, through different areas of New York, doing something that was not, in this day and age, it is actually hard to do something that catches people's eyes or is in some way unusual. <laughs> because if you think about what happens in public space, spectacle is at an all-time high, right? You know, I mean, you're, um, it's a lot to grapple with. So this is at Gowanus Canal, um, and this was actually the first at, at the ExxonMobil spill. Um, I did that partially with the collaboration of River Keepers, which is an amazing organization that that um, was able to level some suits against ExxonMobil and bring a lot of attention to that oil spill, um, which I would say, in effect, is why it is now a super fun, super fun site. Um, in this case, this is. Uh, I had an Oktoberfest party with um, the Gowanus Dredgers Club, and they, uh, they basically bring people into the water of the Gowanus Canal as a way to teach them about what's, what the, what's happening in that space, right? So that was, that's a space where if you fall in it, you should basically go to the emergency room immediately. They were studying um, sort, sort of super, super bodies living on top of the canal water, um, because as antibodies become uh, irrelevant or un they, as they become, um, they don't work basically, um, these super bodies may. Or there's like a famous case where uh, they were finding like gonorrhea in um, the Gowanus Canal existing. So um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful waterway. And, but it's, a, it's an interesting thing to think about that this, uh, that this organization, the Dredgers Club, have any of you ever done this or been there, been to the Guanus Canal? Or you can go there on if you look on their website, you can go and take a canoe out. Um, but it's 
it's a, it's a really interesting way that they work in a community to actually bring people into the place that they should be concerned about in their, in their neighborhoods. Okay, and then this is the third burn, uh, which is the West Village. It was from the pier, which is you know, traditionally and still a place where um, like gay and lesbian, trans people have gathered for a very, like decades. And um, it's also a place where a park has been built um, that, or sort of a park has been enacted that doesn't want, doesn't want kind of poor populations or populations that will be there constantly um, as it becomes sort of more bourgeois and, um, and gentrified. So in this case, I was thinking a lot about, about what it, what is there any kind of gay community? Um, is there solidarity across these sort of class and racial boundaries? And um, <laughs> and what can we, what can something like smudging to get rid of all of that extremely bad energy that's been occurring um, in that place due to gentrification? Can we can we just take a minute to think about it and have a procession? <laughs> so we proceeded to or processed, I should say to the Stonewall Inn, which was the, um, which is the site of, uh, of the Stonewall Riots, which basically started the contemporary um, gay rights movement. And this is Melissa Anderson reading Sylvia Rivera's oral history of those, of those riots. She's right here in our audience. Fantastic reader. <laughs> um, and then this was the day before the 2008 election, um, which, and it was also the fall that the economy really tumbled. 2000, do any of you remember that moment? Uh, there was a really indecisive moment about like, wow, everything that we have thought is possible um, like in an American economy or, or to be taken granted, you know, or you can take, take it for granted, suddenly up in the air a little bit. <laughs> And, um, and also, it was a historic presidential race where were we going to have um, our first black president? Were we going to have uh, something looking towards uh, progress? Um, which I think eight years later or seven years later, we have a different relationship to that. But um, so I chose Federal Hall for the last burn, and that is the place where uh, George Washington was inaugurated as the first president of the U.S. Um, and also it's on Wall Street. So it felt like it was like the crux of all everything that was happening in that moment of that fall. Um, in this one, I just, it was the last and I thought, well, they're never going to let me burn sage. I actually was really surprised that I got away with it ever um, on the streets of New York, but I would kind of make these permits that had nothing to do with smoke and I could pull them out if um, I was stopped or I would I would call the precincts and tell them, which is, you know, it's sort of a scrappy way to do a public art project, but it worked. And in this case, um, it was through the park district and they didn't seem to mind. Um, and, but just in case I had made these dancer, these costumes for dancers um, that were, I wanted to have dancers that could be smoke if I couldn't light the actual smudge stick. So, um, and I also had, I also had a tarot card reader, Shelley Marlowe, dressed as um, George Washington um, to sort of read tarot cards for into the future. Um, and I also had uh, readings. One is my mom reading the Declaration of Independence and the other is Abby Williams reading um, Franklin D. Roosevelt's inaugural speech like in, in the Great Depression. So this was a really amazing smudge because the dancers danced, um, the tarot card reader cast cards, people asked these really intense questions, other people just, it was a very odd, uh, it was a very odd public event because we got stockbrokers, we got uh, sort of general tourist public, um, and, and it was really, it was sort of a, a fascinating, cross-section of people who were all generally anxious no matter who they were about what was going to happen the next day. <laughs> so, um, 
Also, if you have any questions, if you think that I'm skipping over something, because I could be, um, please ask me. Uh-huh. She was one of the dancers. It was, the dancers were Emily Royston, Anne Hall, um, Layla, oh my goodness. Let me go down. Uh, Layla Childs, uh, Colin Stilwell, and Sarah White. So um, Layla, Colin, and Sarah are dancers. They're amazing dancers. Um, Emily and Anne, I knew were just wacky enough to do it and <laughs> capable of that, so um, I asked them. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, it's, I've been in a million people's performances. I think peop a million people have been <laughs> mine, certainly, and I think that's changed for me as I've gone. This felt very much like putting together groups of people who were interested, or um, in this case, uh, the other person in the Moomoo, Moo, the matchy Moomoo, Moo, is Leah Gilliam, who is a good friend, who was just kind of there on the first one, and she was like, you can't carry that thing by yourself. <laughs> And then I was like, oh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so she carried it. And then I was like, if I make you a moo, -moo will you do it next time? <laughs> and she said yes. So that's, and then for the readings, Melissa, our esteemed guest here, um, also, you know, I just thought about people I knew who I knew that were friends that I could ask to come and um, do these readings who would have a, a personal investment in one way with what, what it was that they were reading. So um, Melissa read Silva Rivera, which I think you had a fantastic time doing. Um, Jeff Hendricks, I had, who is an older Fluxus artist, I had him read um, a portion of Whitman's Leave, Leaves of Grass about being in the city. Um, had actually Emily Royston read the Gay Activist Alliance um, guideline, or their sort of organizing principles, and uh, Robert Marshall read an oral history of a lesbian who had just missed the Stonewall riots because she was like, well, it, th they happen all the time in New York, it's fine. And so it was this, you know, these kind of like missing a history as an oral history. No, there was no music. I just said, I said, imagine that you're smoke <laughs> and move in a circle around the plinth. Um, that was my direction. And I gave them the signs that had existed that said things like cleanse, smudge, New York. Um, and then, of course, this one said tarot for tomorrow, but that was special for Shelley. Um, but that, it was this sort of like ragtag takeover. And I think even the people who ran the space, they were really used to having protests, but they had no idea what was going to happen that day. And they were really surprised. <laughs> I think it was absolutely engaging with spectacle in its highest form. And where you know you had, and I never performed when I did this. I just thought of myself as a person who was talking like I'm talking now, um, and it was not a perf like a sort of um, a shaped performance. It was more my own self. The people, people just kind of walked up, and some people watched. People asked a lot of questions. Um, the tarot card readings were really intense because people had a lot of questions and they were all kind of like trying to get there and I didn't know any of them at all. I also would smudge at every time. If it, I'd be like, if you want me to smudge you, you know, you can do that. And, and people would be like, are you like a shaman? I'd be like, no, I'm not at all. You could do this at home. You know, like it's, like, like it's, a, it's a thing, like it's an intention, right? You know, so um, that, was, that was kind of what, I, what happened and, and in this case, there was a palpable feeling of anxiety <laughs> in the air in that moment of history. Um, and there were a lot of people standing in the place where they were like, oh, I get it. We're on Wall Street, and this is where the first president was inaugurated. You know, like, and, and also, this thing is happening, and it's giving me a chance to think about it. So, I mean, maybe some people hated it. They didn't tell me, but <laughs> they may have. <laughs> so. Um, I give them the right to do that. Um, so also from doing a performance project, 
like that where I had all of these texts, all of uh, this, all of these different people that were involved. In the end, I, a couple years, uh, in 2012 actually, I made this book um, that collected, collected all of the text and um, had like accounts from people who witnessed it and um, just a lot of like the things that people read, um, sort of, I thought about it as holding artifacts of the work too. So, and also like I wrote an essay in the front that was why, about why I did the piece. So, um, I'm gonna show from this project, I was asked to do a project in um, Puerto Rico at Beta Local, which is um, a really amazing um, artist organized space in San Juan. And they were like, we really want you to come and smudge Puerto Rico. We really need it. And I was like, I, um, I, was, I, and I love them. They're such amazing people. But I was really unsure about how to approach that. So um, I went there and, um, and I did some workshops with people and I, and I was just like, I don't, you know, I live in New York. I know what the problems are for me living there. I don't, I don't live in Puerto Rico, so tell me. And then I realized that there was, it was this kind of consistent um, colonial incursion um, from the past into the present. Like this is um, Columbus landing in Hispaniola, I think. Um, but this is, so this is sort of the ultimate incursion into the Americas, right? Um, and I thought a lot about, but even to the present day, there's sort of outside interests, um, like through, through Puerto Rico being a, a territory of the United States, there are continued outside interests in um, building infrastructure, which will never actually be used or be for anything, like, but yet makes a certain group of people, of already wealthy people, <coughs> even wealthier. Or, um, so that is a form of incursion, like economic incursion, right? So those were the things that um, I started to think about being there. Um, and the first, that first time I was there, I went to um, the Luis Munoz Marin Foundation, and he was sort of the first uh, governor of Puerto Rico who was actually Puerto Rican and sort of started the, like the contemporary, like modern age, I guess, of, um, Puerto Rico's um, territorial existence with the United States. And he was a very complicated figure. Um, so that was some, he was someone who kept coming up in discussions. So I was like, well, let's go there and actually smudge the foundation. And so we did that and sort of and spent a lot of time kind of continuing the conversations from the workshops before. Um, then I came back about a month later and <laughs> we, Decided to, I, we did three places. One was um, the different, it was a, we did it as a mobile cleansing with the, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's in old San Juan, there's a Burberry, yeah. Um, th we sort of, t we took the curator's car and we put these uh, loudspeakers on top, sort of like something that, which would be a way that someone would sell something um, or a religious broadcast. But in this case, we smudged um, all of the different places where Ponce de Leon had been buried in Old San Juan as sort of thinking of those places and being emblematic of the colonial imperative in Puerto Rico. So after Columbus came Ponce de Leon and um, really brutalized the the native population um, and basically put in place um, all of like the, the colony from Spain. So um, we also read as we drove, it was me and um, another man who's a writer, oh, his name just slipped me. Um, uh, and he, we read different things. So we started with Aristotle on um, on uh, sort of what defines human, what defines animal, what defines slave, so what defines one's um, worth, right? Uh, also, uh, de las casas, which is theological law, um, which is still the basis of international law, um, but it was theology about, like, is, do the natives have souls? Um, and he was fighting for yes. Um, so. These are the sites, and this was, and some of this was really brutal language, um, 
being read and smudged through the streets. Sure, it, I would say that I'm not a research-based artist by any means because that is not the final place where I think, I don't think my work really exists essentially in research. I think I do copious amounts of research um, and I transfer that to form like in some way. Um, this, in this case, it was like excerpting text, right? So it's a bit more, um, like you see the, res the trail of research. Uh, much clearer, but yeah, it's something, I think it's, I, I learn from my work because out of curiosity and um, I bring things to it in that same way, right? Like that, that, that's a part of, I wouldn't go to Puerto Rico and just light up a smudge stick. Like, you know, that I would find that to be a highly problematic position as um, someone making culture in, in a place, right? Or any, actually anything that I do, like I think that it's, it's very important that I am curious, well I just am curious about like the situation in which I'm, I'm about what, what, the, what the topics are, what the place is, if there's no place, what is it that I'm actually interested in um, for the work, so. All of it, all of it. There's no rule, really, I don't think. Yeah, there, there can be. Yeah. I think it depends on the culture that is doing it specifically, or if it can be a very impromptu thing um, that is outside, it can be a personal ritual or it can be a highly ordained ritual, which, you know, like censors in the Catholic Church are just another remainder of that. I mean, in some way it's research, it's like looking at the historic, place of, um, of theology and colonialism in Puerto Rico, but then at the same time reading it through loudspeakers and driving around with this much stick out of the back of a car is a really different, I mean that's a weird mashup there. I, I consider it one and more interesting than others. Um, this is a place called Paso de Indio and um, it's a place where they wanted to put a gas line through, like sort of through the center of Puerto Rico, which makes no sense. It was to go from one side to the other um, when actually it's an island and you could just go around it, right? You wouldn't actually need to transport gas from one side of the island to the other side of the island. Does that make sense to you? Like they wanted to put a pipeline in from like, we're gonna down, we're gonna, you know, unload oil here and then pick it up here on the other side. So. <laughs> Like that was sort of the premise, and that's what I mean about like infrastructure in, in Puerto Rico that w is building infrastructure that's about an economy that um, is not actually useful within uh, any of the needs of, of, uh, of like industry or anything in that place. So um, this was also an overpass that uh, when they started to dig down, they realized that, that it was like 12,000 years of civilization that they had kind of hit that was pre-Taino, which is the, the sort of when um, at, at um, contact or Columbus, that was, the, um, that was the civilization that was in place. But in this case, there was, there was obviously um, ceremonial things happening when they were, where they dug down into, to put those pilings in. So it was felt like this very, dirty place. Um, there's also about to build across these, uh, the, this gas line and, and go through this as well. So we smudged there. It's also, it was kind of a garbage dump. At th there was also something else that, I don't, there was a point where I found a newspaper article uh, which I read um, along with the um, archeologist report about when they dug down into the ground in this place um, and found these remains. Um, but I found a, a newspaper article that the, uh, it's kind of in the public housing, they had hired a, a, private, a private company to go in and remove pets from people, um, but they were supposed to take them to the pound, but instead they just shot them full of, um, 
uh, the stuff that would put animals to sleep, like an, uh, when they were going to operate on them, but they put, put them put a lot in and then just brought them and threw them over the overpass. So that was also just sort of like this other sort of accumulation of like lack of of uh, care and ethics for uh, like a place and and lives. So that's a graffiti no no gasaduto. Then the third place was. Uh, the place, the other, end, like at one end of the island where the, the gas line was supposed to come out. And um, it's called Playa de Levitown, and it's a Levitown like, uh, like the planned suburbs of, uh, which the first one was in Pennsylvania, I believe. Does anyone, do you know Levitowns? Levitown was in Long Island. Was it in Long Island? Okay. And then, but there's the second or third, like later was in Pennsylvania. I think, but it's a, like a planned community. Um, so this was a Levittown in, um, to the west of San Juan. Um, but it was also a place called El Resort, which was um, the people who lived there had built, it's also a lot of garbage <laughs> washes up in this place, and they built this amazing resort um, out of stuff, but it was about to be closed because of the gas line. Um, so we did a smudge there, and um, it was two days after um, after Fukushima, and um, and so thinking a lot about what happens when you have infrastructure in places and it goes wrong. Um, so I read an article about that, and also um, William Levitt's obituary, who was the founder of Levittowns. Um, And then Beta Local produced this lovely book of the texts and images. So, uh, I'm gonna talk real quick about this, watch me. Um, <laughs> this was a project I had gotten a grant to go to Svalbard, which is an island in the Arctic above Norway and Russia. Um, more Norway, really. And, um, and for the grant, I was really interested in the Global Seed Vault, which is a, uh, it's sort of a very publicly known seed vault that um, gathers seeds from around the world to hold them in case of um, like the extinction of the plants in its natural environment or, but there's a lot of different versions of seed vaults. So in some way it's, it's an absurd notion that if all plant life died that you would go to this place and have any means of replanting it in the first place. Does that make sense? Like that, that, that usually there would be a problem in, there's a problem in the formulation, that scientific formulation. Um, but at the same time, I was just really curious about that as a place. So as being this I idealized safe place, and it was considered safe because the seeds would be in permafrost um, on this island. So um, I went there, and then I, I actually, in the end, realized I, when I was there, like Norway and Russia signed a treaty, and they were both on this island, sort of holding it down. Um, and I realized that that island was actually more about um, resource battles, right? So between like waiting for the treaties to fall into place for offshore drilling in the Arctic, and basically what's going to come in the Arctic region as um, the as the thaw happens. So. Um, and also that the seed vault is funded by Monsanto Corporation um, subsidiaries. So something happened and a plant died. Do you think that you know, you'd actually see the seeds? Probably not. Um, and I'm being a little flip about it, but you know, it was one of, it's one of those situations where it's like, oh, this is, there's something deeply kind of wrong with this story. So I ended up taking photographs there. Um, and I think, like I work across a lot of media, but um, I was trained primarily as a photographer and I, I often come back to it. Um, but you'll see as we go, I've moved far away from it as well. Uh, but in this case, I felt like the surface of the photograph kind of lied and it never could tell the truth that I wanted it to. Um, so this photograph I sort of thought about is sort of block, trying to block the information, like how somehow this place did block the information that was actually perfectly clear and on the surface. 
and I didn't want any of the photographs to sort of be on a wall or seem authoritative, so I wanted them to kind of be on the ground, fall. Um, this is an image with a cut in it. In the show, there was a f for a show in LA at Commonwealth and Council called um, The Shore is Still in the Sea. And uh, so this idea that even if something says it's one thing, it's actually still a part of another, um, which is what I was thinking about the political situation of that sea vault. This is an image of uh, the Law of the Sea Treaty, which has never been ratified and kind of allows a lot of the behavior that uh, sort of neoliberal behavior to occur um, and continue occurring. So this is a cast of my hand holding it. Um, this is another image of, uh, it's this role which you have to kind of look inside of and it's WikiLeaks about Arctic oil exploration, which are really amazing. Um, these are images of the concentration of of, the, of sort of like making images of a lack of energy and the beginning of energy. Uh, that's the vault, the seed vault doors. This is just something I found written on the, <laughs> on the ground. And these were two sort of larger prints that hung side by side. Again, for this, I made a, I, actually the gallerist, Yang Chung, who I love dearly in such a, very smartly basically said like, I want you to make an artist book for the show. So I ended up um, doing that as well. And this is like a written, handwritten note about ways that the world could end in one sitting, that I, a list that I made. Or this is um, the funders for the seed vault. So thinking about all of those things as a part of, um, as a part of the information that was in that project. Um, 35 minutes, okay. This is a project that I did at Exit Art, and I was invited to do, it was like a week-long residency that kind of culminated towards something, was what they said. We, we want you to do a project that builds towards something at the end. And I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> and, and I had been thinking a lot about time. I'd been thinking about the end of the world. I'd been thinking about the, sort of these apocalyptic anxiety. Um, it was in 2012. Who wouldn't have been thinking about it? Um, and so I, I organized this series of talks, meetings, workshops, and um, a performance in the end. And um, this is something I built before I went in, and it's a series of pieces that make a timeline. Um, and then I just started through the week having these groups. So this is a physicist, Dr. Paul Halpern, who um, came and we had a book group where we read an H.P. Lovecraft story, um, the, the short story, The Time Machine, and then he talked about, um, he talked about how, like the sort of fallacies and truths in H.P. Lovecraft's ideas, like in his science fiction, and then um, actually what was more interesting was how much weirder the, um, the actual scientists and physicists, their, their ideas about time are, that are absolutely not lived. Um, we cannot deal with them with anything but linear time in the present in some way. So um, that was really interesting. Um, the second event was, uh, it was a discussion with, a, I sort of cold called this opera dramaturg, um, Corey Ellison and asked her if she would come in and talk about the last act of Gotta Damn Wrong, which means like Twilight of the Stars in German. Um, and to talk about, in this case, women and retribution and like an end time. Um, so that was really interesting. Uh, this was a, a ready, it was a, called a readiness workshop with Anne Hall and um, we made Mayan, uh, or um, astrology, like horoscope readers, which were really complicated wheels to figure out your Mayan horoscope. Um, and then we hired uh, a yoga mime, um, who was this woman who specialized in doing mime with yoga intentionality. Um, and we had her mime to the Mayan creation story. <laughs> So um, it was like this workshop and then this kind of performance that she interpreted as she heard it, which she was really game and really amazing. 
Um, and then in the end, there was a performance kind of about the week. And, um, and it was with, again, a group of friends who I pulled in friends. I just thought about, I knew that I had this um, internet, it was an internet forum about anxiety about the world ending. Um, that ended up being, a th it was kind of, I just lifted that as a script for one part and I cast friends as those performers, just based on imagining hearing their voices, um, re reading the certain parts. Um, Rainy Ortica, who's sitting right here too, who works here, was the composer. Um, and we composed a song for the end as well. This is an interview with my dog about her consciousness, so about her, con her consciousness and her concept of time. Um, so the, some of the questions are, is your desire for food a sign of consciousness or a reflex? <laughs> How do you react to the statement, animals are highly emotional people with very limited intelligence? Um, and then this was sort of like something that you know, was an, an unanswerable question. And then this is the, um, the internet forum being read as a script by the performers. Um, and it t turns into a sort of theological battle about, um, well, Catholicism is trying to enact itself and then um, someone else is, who's written in the first place has some anxiety um, and is trying to understand that anxiety and not getting much help and other people are piping in as they do on an internet forum with like, I, I'm afraid all the time, and then they disappear, you know, which is like a really interesting way to think about a, like using a script, and I was just like, I'm just going to lift this and use it in real time. Um, so that's them reading. You know, some of these people are repeat performers, and I asked them just all to hold the sign, hold the, the timeline together. And it ended in a song about the end of the world, which um, Rainy and I worked on together, and it was really fun. And a lot of things, these things end up kind of ongoing. So then when the, the timelines turned over, they were just these very um, kind of ranging statements, like, uh, you know, alliteration to, I'm fine. Um, okay, I'm gonna move 41 minutes, okay keeping track of myself. Um, I'm gonna talk about now about a performance which led into the work at the New Museum pretty directly for me. And it was a performance at X Initiative and also at PS1 MoMA um, that was called What? Um, and it was a performance that was largely about language or the failure of language um, to explain or tell about our experiences um, or uh, history, even. Um, so this first, this first image is, it was it served as, as an epilogue, it was about eight parts. Um, and this, there were three performers in this piece, myself, Juliana Snapper, who's an amazing trained um, soprano, and Emma Hedich, who's also a performer of a very, very different kind, like much more kind of awkward and um, hesitant and always very much herself. So I thought about like actually Juliana and Emma as being very different presences in a performance. Um, and this, this image is where we're, it's an epilogue for the piece and we're um, harmonizing from this opera called Lachme. Um, and I have a real interest in opera you'll come to see um, shortly, but this opera is sort of an Orientalist French opera from the late 18th century by Delib, and um, it also houses this, uh, this duet called the Flower Song, which is known as sort of like the lesbian duet of, op of the history of opera, where it's about like, your flower is so beautiful, no yours is. <laughs> and so we took this and kind of like took it out of context and put it in this device which sort of showed the interaction in the air between two bodies. Um, and that was in thinking about uh, like singing and sound and how, how those, how could I actually kind of make that visible? So I made this object and that's a balloon in the middle that kind of expands and contracts. Second part is um, 
uh, I lifted a quote from um, Derrida's autobiographies, and it's a chapter called Logic of the Living Feminine. Um, and it's sort of a treatise to an audience um, about like, you know, we're here, you're here reading this, and I'm writing it, and how are we going to, um, how are we going to come to some agreement about what it is that we're doing here? Um, and so as I read this, uh, I started to drop words out as it went to, um, so it would be, and I was thinking about what happens in an audience that drives me crazy in response, which is, hmm, uh-huh, hmm, mm hmm You know, those kinds of things, have you ever been to a lecture where people do that? It makes me personally kind of crazy. Um, it's like needing to, needing to be heard despite. So um, I, was, I was thinking about like compressing the audience and the sort of speaker together. Uh, this is another part where um, Emma is reading from uh, Mary Daly's eco-feminist classic, um, Gyne Ecology, The Metaethics of Radical Feminism. And it's a statement about uh, why, like this idea of wildness as um, re like women repatriating wildness as a means of um, gaining freedom. Um, but then I, I've, oh, you know, have a have a problem with this sort of politically and like what it what it does in terms of privileged uh, middle class white feminism, and um, and what's happening in other parts of the world. So uh, this we also the Juliana and I. Juliana's sort of uh, enacting Charcot's contortions of hysteria, which Charcot was a psychiatrist, or a doctor, I think he wasn't even a psychiatrist, he was just a doctor, um, who, who sort of charted out these, um, these physical contortions of women's bodies in the Victorian age as um, pointing towards hysteria, or being hysterical, but actually he would do things like hire prostitutes to enact the forms. Um, there's a great book about it. Um, and then I'm enacting Lean Wolf's uh, address to the U.S. Congress in American Sign Language, or excuse me, Indian Sign Language, um, that was delivered when he came and he said, like, you know, you, he traveled all the way to the U.S. Congress and he said, like, um, for four years we welcomed you, um, then you betrayed us, and that is all. But so it's this idea of, like, not even having the words to explain, or trying to use this means that would cross different linguistic boundaries to say, y you didn't come through on your end of the bargain. So I think about both of those non-spoken like, communications as being about being kind of forsaken. Um, this is another part where, you know, because I'm thinking in a lot of these pieces about putting together um, putting together a lot of different, um, like almost montaging things together and, and causing through performance for people to think about these things together whether they ever have or not. So this is another part of the performance where um, it's taking a piece from a Gertrude Stein play called An Exercise in Analysis and, um, and the lines are, can you sing? I have asked you that before. I can ask you that again. You can if you like. Can you not vary it? By what? By making changes. Oh, yes. So depending on who says what, it's a completely portable form of language, and it can mean very different things based on who says it and how they say it. So we said it four different times, and um, sort of by me saying the first two lines and then the th her saying the third or her saying the first line and me saying the second, it just it changes the meaning, like a lot of Gertrude Stein's writing. This is another part called Speak and Spell. This was the version at PS1. Um, there's that first part that you've seen before. This was without Emma, just um, Juliana and I. And this was much more, I thought about this as being much more plugged in and the first version being kind of unplugged um, because we did things like we used the sound uh, of albums or of the dragging of, of the needle um, and in this case, we used um, we used uh, the albums to sing kind of like the pinnacle part of this performance, which was um, a call that this woman Sandra Harold made to 911 in Connecticut in 2000, 2009, 
when her chimpanzee attacked her friend. Um, it was this really famous case. And this call to the, to the dispatcher went viral on the internet where it's her calling and trying to get them to come because her chimpanzee is like attacked her friend and ripped her friend's face off. And like the friend was on Oprah. Did any of you ever see this? It was like this pop cultural moment. Um, but basically this woman had kept her chimpanzee as a person. She had it on Xanax. She gave it wine. She was trying to, she was, she thought of the, of the chimp as her child in a way, but it didn't, that didn't line up, right? So there, that, that didn't, that wasn't possible for her to, um, for her to treat the animal as if it was human and for it to become human. Like that's not how things work. Um, and that was in some way the outcome of that. Um, so in this, she calls and she's trying to get them to come, but even her own use of language is failing and she keeps saying like, come with guns. And they're like, who has the guns? Who, you know, and we turned it into a duet where it's sung. Uh, so it's really kind of demented and sad all at once. Um, and then this piece ends with Juliana reading a letter from Margaret Mead, uh, the sort of very famous anthropologist to Ruth Benedict, um, who was also a fairly famous anthropologist, um, who was her on-again, off-again lover. Um, and Margaret Mead was, had a really complicated relationship to sexuality, um, monogamy, like she kind of couldn't be monogamous. She was innately bisexual. Um, and she, in the letter, she's relating this dream about being in Franz Boas's lab and touching this beautiful blue liquid and no one knew what it was. No one could name it, you know, and, and then finally, she just said like, it's life. And, and in her dream, Franz Boas was like, yes. And so to me that sort of, that indicated in that letter, the un, like the sort of other side of um, the formation of knowledge and especially for an anthropologist, right? Um, and that was the end of the piece. So this whole idea of naming and labeling and categorizing actually not functioning. And this was a book I made for this too, because if you don't know anything about me yet, you know that I love a book. And, but it was a way to archive and think about performance. Um, and I love this book because on the back it says, sometimes you wanna know what happened and then sometimes you just, you, <laughs> what, is, what is it? <laughs> sometimes you can't be there so you, it's good to know what happened. Sometimes you're there and still want to know. <laughs> which, which I thought about, like these were confusing performances, but at the same time, um, I, I was really interested in these books as, as holding and documenting everything that had been in it. That was really minus the performance and the affect of performance. Okay, last thing, um, which is big. <clears throat> it, this is a poster for the project that I did at uh, the new museum. Um, and the larger project was, it was a five month residency at the museum. It was a symposium, or it was a symposium at the end of a, um, a reading seminar with a, an amazing group of people. Um, it was an exhibition. It was a series of public programs, like, a, like I had like a panel discussion. I had um, sessions inside of the show. Um, there were, there was a symposium at the end of the reading seminar. Um, I had an experimental opera, also other kind of public, public performance projects. So it was a really big, great project for me and um, a great chance to, to be supported in making work in an unusual way, like outside of just a normal exhibition model where come, you put your work up, maybe you do a performance and then you go. No, um, in this case, it was much more about like, how can I <laughs> begin? I will literally be in this place every day for um, five months, six months. So um, it was it was really interesting. The first and the first thing I'll talk about is the um, the, perf the the exhibition, which the exhibition being called "Here, Here." I was thinking about the idea of of actually hearing something and then having thinking about contact with 
place or site and um, kind of those two words sounding the same but actually meaning different things. So like a kind of interconnectedness between um, interaction and, and, and place. Um, so this is, when you walked into the exhibition, this is what it looked like. And I was thinking a lot about performance, about objects that can be used as catalysts for performances, um, about how audiences react to, um, to s situations with, you know, with performers or where, um, what their role is too. Um, and I'd been interviewing sort of cultural connoisseurs about why they love uh, mostly, it was mostly opera actually, but why they sort of seek out that, that information so much. So um, when you walked in, you saw this theater chair and you saw a curtain um, and those were sort of the first things. And so, you know, when you enter the space, you also enter the back or onto the stage of a theater. Um, also to the side was this, was this print, which is um, a kind of folding, um, a print that's also an object. Uh, it's an intaglio print, and um, and its dimensionality is kind of about expanding and collapsing image architecture, also the body and the landscape, and then this kind of joke of the body's anatomy, and um, that's vocal cords in the middle. It is not a vagina, uh, but I sort of loved that conflation of of the scope with um, like a fear of the female in the end, but instead it's about sort of a vocality. This is when you walk through the curtains. You, these are all set pieces. The first to the right is, an, is a light that's based on the shape of an eyeball, but it's sort of the paradox of instead of collecting light and information, it's um, producing light, sort of very bright and focused light through a lens. Uh, the other is a mountain that's also a cave. Um, and then the other, which we'll get to, is a, a horn based on the shape of the ear. So it's the interior of the cave, and that's all handmade felt. And for me, this is about craft and having, making space in my work to actually have craft occur too. So I, with Kim K, um, we made, I don't know, yards and yards of, of handmade felt out of wool. And that's in like contrast to the sort of the hardness of the of the mountain. That's the eyeball light, and then this is uh, a brass horn based on the shape of the inner, middle, and outer ear. So it, again, it's a paradox. The reversal of um, of the ear is something to collect sound, but instead it's um, creating it. And there's also these inserts that go in that sort of roundish tube area of the horn that are, um, that are, it's the shape in, if you do research on synthetic speech, um, a lot of it's about the shape of the vocal cavity to make vowels. So um, these are um, these, the, the different, these are these inserts for the horn that are like A, E, I, O, U. So the vowel as being, kind of the creator of language or definition of language. That's the cochlea. It's, you know, it's approximated, it's not exactly, because that would be hard. And I um, built, built this with this great, very weird, brave um, brass instrument repair person, Chuck McAlexander, who was such a great guy, and he would be like, well, that's not how that's 400 years of research down the drain on brass instruments. And I'd be like, oh, well. <laughs> and he'd be like, all right, here we go. <laughs> I'm changing, like, because he'd be like, the, the width of the tube is like this, is only this, and the length is only this. And I was like, well, that's not really what I want. And he'd be like, great. <laughs> OK. So but a lot of horn, like horn, like brass instrument people were just, they didn't want to touch it, because it was, <laughs> it was not something that they were interested, you know, you know, I don't know. It did, you'll hear it in a minute. Um, and as you kind of came in and turned around, there was also this video installation. Um, and it was a video, it was from a performance project called the Rocky Horror Opera Show. And this came out of this, my research project, um, where 
I had I'd been watching this documentary about Fran Lebowitz, and at one point someone said, like, what's the, what do you think the effect of the AIDS crisis was on, uh, on arts and culture in New York? And she was like, <sighs> in her sort of, you know, uh, over the top way was like, it killed everyone who mattered died. And um, which a lot of people did die. But she, she then went on to talk about like, what does it mean to create culture when you don't have an audience who has been there caring about it for a long time um, and pass that knowledge on in sort of non-familial ways. Um, and is kind of very queer, really, um, or you know, predominantly was, and also makers, like in terms of cultural producers. What happens when you lose a big chunk of people in their vital time to um, culture? And then I was like, that is, of course, so devastating, and yet another way of thinking about the AIDS crisis. But I also was thinking about. What is it that compels people to be interested in culture, in, in, in the cultural form that they are um, really riveted to as an audience member, as a connoisseur, or like a non-professional, um, a non-professional lover of, of a form? That often, you know, before this century, those were the people who were art historians before that was professionalized, right? Or those were the people who wrote um, and collected. Uh, the information about performing arts. Um, and so because of our professionalization, we are we don't really, you know, in the arts, we, we don't have a place really for that audience right now, other than supposedly having them as subscription sales, but I think that's actually something quite different. Um, so I decided that I wanted to do something um, where, an audience could be, could interact with performances of, um, and I, Corey Ellison, who was the person who came in, I cold called to come in to talk about Gotter Damrung. She, I was talking to her and she was like, let's do this, let's make this happen. Let's, and I, and I was like, okay, let's get opera singers and do sort of like a best of performance and also at the same time, engage an audience in somehow being a part of it in a different way than how it's prescribed to behave with opera or, or um, like classical music. So um, what we ended up doing, this is in this performance shows, uh, here's the flyer for it. And it's basically like, these are the pieces that are performed. These are the singers. Um, you are being videotaped. And um, we had Kim K and I, who helped me make the felt as well, I, I asked him to be in charge of designing costumes based on the different arias being performed, and um, which is basically like Carmen, um, Mini Mantillas, um, poor people, rich people, uh, uh, also like the bride from Lucia de Lammermoor, Lucia. Um, and then the piece was this two channel. I'll just show you an excerpt. There we go. I'm Carmen. Go. No, I'm no, Carmen. But if I really wanted to say it, I would say I am. And this was Carmen. two separate channels. How do you want to be tonight? Because we also have like rich men, poor men. Well, we've got like tr like ladies garb. Okay, ladies and then we, garb. Okay, ladies garb it is. Ladies <laughs> garb. Oh, and then opera. Now wait a minute, you know what? Are you an obnoxious clown or a polyachi clown? Yeah. You know what? It's your little world. Here's the makeup. <laughs> we've got. Okay, so the, I also invited in um, sort of hardcore opera fans, which that guy right there is a hardcore opera fan. Uh, which he sang along with the chorus. There was other people that sort of interrupted it as it went. Um, uh, but you know, he was like, "Am I? What, what kind of clown am I? Am I Pagliacci?" And it was like, "Yeah, you're Pagliacci." Like in the end. But I love how um, Lisi, who's standing there, didn't actually know it was Pagliacci and went, like, "It's your little world." But she <laughs> but in fact, it was Pagliacci. Um, let me go a little further here. Oh, 
So that's just one part. It, it kind of went, the, it was a really interesting night because when you tell people like, you can do whatever you want to, here you are in costumes. You can, here you have some costumes, you just sit here and um, you are being put in close contact with these really amazing opera singers because they were really superb and um, they were very game too. And um, you, you're allowed to sort of do what you'd like. Um, and that was interesting because the whole room vibrated. It was like it suddenly became a 19th century audience again that had a really different engagement with the form than um, I think what our kind of removal at this point is. Um, we associate like a complete removal from classical music, right? Where it's, you have no contact, you can't cross the line. But in fact, audiences are very important to opera singers. Um, in terms of the reaction that they elicit. <laughs> okay. So that was a strange way for me to think through like an audience and their reaction. Um, there's the everyone sort of sitting in there. It got really crazy at certain points. It got very quiet at others. Um, this is sort of like the pinnacle moment where someone came up and took a selfie with the singer, which I was like, of course you did. <laughs> you know, that, that of course this is sort of what, what people will do, um, which I felt like he did that because he knew that was, he was performing um, contemporary culture for everyone. Um, and then back to the exhibition, the, the space is kind of an L and the back corner of that exhibition space has always, seemed to me and being in it to be a bit like a closet. So I literally used it as a closet for the costumes. So like this sort of leftover remnant. That's looking into that closet. Then these are also these touch scores. So instead of reading music, but thinking more about like, what is it like to touch something and interpret it with voice? And that was for, because all of these objects that were in here other than the Rocky Horror Opera Show were about and towards the making of this final performance or um, that I had been writing over all of last year. And I was interested in, in, in not having a, a relationship of vision only to um, like kind of vocal interpretation, but having a relationship of touch being just as legitimate and, and maybe more interesting. And then this is an image that was in the back behind those closets if you look like this. And um, again, this idea of caves or, um, which I hadn't really talked about yet, um, as sort of this idea of the formation of knowledge in one way, right? Like you have Plato. Um, and also this conflation of the body uh, with landscape um, instead of a separation of, of the human and the site in some way. Um, okay, I'm gonna run quickly through this stuff. This is, uh, panel discussion uh, with Steve Cawson, Mara Mills, Johanna Burton, and Greg Borderwitz. Uh, these are, I did these events during the show, like I was thinking if I've made this stage, shouldn't people perform and do things on it? And so, um, and under the sort of the idea of voice or um, under, the, yeah, under the idea of voice, I had invited um, nine different people in to do projects inside of the gallery space. So. This was on um, May 1st, International Workers' Day, and it was um, Angel Navarez and um, Valerie Tavari doing another protest song, which is karaoke with a message. Yeah. It was really fun. It was the sort of open night. Um, this is a project uh, where I asked, I worked with these two, Jean Casella and Five Mwali Mac, um, in, on a project called uh, Photo Request from Solitary, where we asked people being held in solitary confinement um, to we, we say that they could request a photograph and then we have artists take them and send them in and then also use them as advocacy um, for against solitary confinement. Um, and so this is a project that Jean and Five do called Voices from Solitary where people write about a typical day. And in this case, they came and had people read, um, people from the audience read these firsthand accounts. Uh, this is Joy Askew, and these were songs sort of only based, she didn't use any instruments, she just used looping, 
to do um, songs for animals um, and a sort of extension of, of ethics um, about animal rights. Rainy Ortica um, did these field recordings of the exhibition and of the objects, which she went on to um, actually compose the music for the opera that was the kind of the final project for the piece. And um, I don't know, you're sitting right here. Did it make it more helpful for you to begin thinking about the objects that would be a part of that piece? But I, th I always thought of it as like, oh, this is actually very smart because it's putting her in contact with these objects and ideas before the actual performance, so. Did that work? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, this is uh, Bea, Bea Santiago Munoz, um, and this is an informal seance with the ghost of Carlos Asombra, who was um, a prison rights activist um, and a founder of the Nietas, which is a prison organization in Puerto Rico. And it was like a, the last recording of his voice um, and a book and a copy of. Um, a book, and so it was really that was really interesting because all these Nieta guys from New York showed up because they'd never heard his voice. Um, and they wanted to because he was very important to their organization. Uh, this is Jolly Mansour uh, giving a talk called Negative Articulation Toward Revolution. This is Kara Baldwin um, doing a project called like trying to enact a human microphone, like from. Um, the Occupy movement in the um, in the gallery space. This is my barbarian singing um, songs from the Civil War, and this is Kelly Pratt playing the horn, um, the aura horn, and he ended up composing and playing those pieces inside of the opera. Uh, so again, like Rainey, I thought of this as being a really helpful way to put him in contact with the objects um, and ideas earlier on. So this is a sign that went up and said, sometimes objects are made to be used, which was an interesting moment uh, in museum, in the world of a museum, where I was like, now I'm gonna take most of these objects downstairs to the theater. Um, and they were like, ah, two people will touch them. And I was like, yes, we'll, we'll sign things. Um, and then I, we did these kind of outlines, like body outlines for the objects for the week that they would be out of the exhibition space. Um, and then they came downstairs and they were in this experimental opera also called Here, Here. Um, and this piece was, I worked on it for over a year in terms of the writing and it was this kind of crazy agitprop montage of putting things next to each other that um, accrued some meaning over time. Um, and you can see that they use all of the objects as kind of catalysts for meaning and catalysts for actually the direction of, of the performers. And there were six performers, um, Beth Griffith, David Gould, Lisa Reynolds, sister my dog, um, Diwa Tamrong, Tony Torn, and Nick Zierhut. And then the musicians, like Rain Rainey Ortica was the composer and also musician, as was Kelly Pratt and John Michael Schwartz played the cello, um, and Kim K again, did the costumes. Um, and these are just some images of different moments. I could also show you an excerpt, and we can end there. This is, the, it sort of moved between these highly theatricalized moments, and then this is a moment in the piece where the performers are just, I had prompted them at a certain point in rehearsal early on where I said, Tell me, tell me the first memory that comes to your mind. And um, they all told these stories, and so then there was a point in the performance where I wanted to stop the theatricality, and they actually just told these stories. Um, and their costumes are based on these kind of classic Socratic theater, um, but they're also wearing these blinders, um, kind of like the slaves that are written about in Plato's Republic. This is a talk show with my dog. Um, this is a statement that is, it's, hi, how are you? Oh, how could I forget this? We need help here, please send help. But it's like the removal, the removal of all of the vowels. So the communicative vowels. This is a touch score. This is a 
portion, that horn would come in at certain points and kind of punctuate um, the piece. I sort of thought of it as a punctuation into the form. Here's a picture of shadow puppets, the performers. And let me show you the actual performance because it's far more interesting than me talking about it. have a number of advantages over the sports metaphors of baseball and football commonly used in business today. As we have noted, the summit of a peak is one of the clearest and most powerful metaphors for achieving a goal or objective. The flexibility of mountain metaphors makes it easier to formulate win-win approaches to cooperative business ventures. Although climbers can compete with each other or the mountain, they don't have to. I think it's clear from our progress today which path is preferable and which path we have chosen. Preferable path! We know that the problems we face are made by human beings. That means it's within our capacity to solve them. Problem solve capacity! Preferable path! Problem solve capacity, working population, idly accept, decisions define, promise defeat, detention prosecution, compound case, politically, socially, economically, legally, loyalist connectivity, favors, cannot function. Again, our guest today is Sister, a canine who we uh, live with on a daily basis and yet know very little about. She's granted us a rare interview and in what I hope to be a more in depth understanding of what makes Sister and those like her tick. Uh, we also have uh, Professor Dara Dahl from the University of South Florida, an expert in human animal communications. Professor Dahl, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. So, um, sister, thank you so much for speaking candidly on the show tonight.
So um, that's just the excerpt. It was like an hour and 20 minutes in whole. And for me, this was the largest sort of collaborative project that I had done with performers, like thinking, of, like thinking almost as a kind of ensemble working model that is very familiar to theater. It is not very familiar to visual artists, performance artists. Um, also working with musicians uh, and at the same time keeping sort of the craft of the objects um, at a certain place so that they, they meant what I wanted them to mean and um, carried their kind of quality at the same time. Um, so that is that piece. Uh, and that was sort of the culmination of the piece at, at the New Museum uh, for me. Um, then I guess the only other thing I have to say about that, and I'll close that I just shot this piece, of them, all of those performers, and th that piece actually had over 23 parts, um, and, and it was really hard for those performers to remember all of those 23 parts and the order they went in and the lines on top of it. Um, and so I just did this piece with them. Uh, I shot it about three weeks ago and I had them come back to the same theater at the new museum and try to remember the piece with zero preparation <laughs> as a kind of the idea of what is an archive, what is memory and how much does it decay <coughs> and how much can they resurrect it. So. Um, these, and this is a piece that's at um, it's at Pierogi right now in the um, in Williamsburg in the um, in the boiler room space. And so it's a pretty funny piece. It's about an hour, a little over an hour, and it's them literally working it out as an ensemble about what happened in the piece, um, which it felt like an, an a more interesting way to archive and kind of keep archiving and thinking about that work and. Um, I'm starting a film based on some of the things I feel like I learned from that project. So, yeah. And that is it. Do you have any questions? There is about seven <coughs> feet, in fact. Mm -hmm. It's burnt really slow. It was 10 feet, and I only burned slow three. Burn. It was a slow burn. <laughs> yeah. They wanted, I figured out that they wanted you to fly them, fly them to the place, pay them like a crazy per diem and a fee, and then they would record it. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, this is a vanity project. <laughs> Amazing. And to think that I spent hours as a kid pouring over it. Like, yeah, it's a vanity project. So. Um, yes, um, yeah, <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely, because it was really, you know, like Mark said earlier on, you know, I was working with people I knew, people kind of in my community of friends, um, and being like, that person can do that. I just have to talk them into it, and, you know, and, and sometimes that would work and sometimes it wouldn't, um, or, you know, like differing degrees, and, um, I'll tell you, when you step it up to like professional musicians, professional performers, and who I knew, not all those people were professional performers, but you know, they, I knew what they were capable of because I'd worked with them before, or some I had never worked with, I'd just seen them work, like perform, and I was really interested in what I knew they could bring, and um, that was great. That was really helpful. It helped me grow what I could do in a staging exponentially, I felt like. So, and I had just spent a year in an R&D group with a lot of theater people and um, as a very odd person out. But I learned a lot about craft from them. So, um, you know, that was helpful too because it's all, it's all different kinds of craft, so. I don't think you can use a cave without pointing directly to Plato and Plato's Republic as the thing which, I don't, did all of you learn about Plato's Republic in school? It feels like it's like the kind of, it's a sort of formative 
idea of what philosophy is, like classic philosophy, and um, there are problems in that, uh, in that classic form, in terms of, uh, like it's, I was thinking about, yes, it is, it, you know, the, the story in uh, Republic that um, is being told is about these slaves with um, blinders on so they can only see, they can only see the shadow of what's happening behind them. So they're learning about this kind of representation. Um, then one of them gets taken out and he's forever changed by um, seeing things directly and understanding th that relationship to his vision before and he can't go back. Um, but in that is a problem of, of I, I actually won't go into that. Uh, <laughs> but I was, I mean, I, it feels like an inevitable part of, of, um, of our perception, right? Like that, that, that story points to perception um, and how we tell uh, the stories of our perception and our knowledge. And um, so for this project, it, like the entire thing felt a lot about, bo about bodies and um, like the internal and the external and paradox um, of, of the internal and external. And um, so a cave became a way to just point directly to um, like a mind formation, but it also is an interesting metaphor for the in, like interiority, right? Of like a body or something that is female um, that was really helpful to me to just pick up and take with me as I would like, you know. So, is that clear? <laughs> kind of? <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's hard, it's hard to ever leave a project in some way, but in this case it felt like I was trying to learn how they were operating as, an, as a unit and as an ensemble unit, and I actually just learned a lot in the past couple weeks of shooting and then editing that, um, that I will then use in how I organize them um, to work in the film. Um, so in a way it's like an anti-archive, right? Because it's not an accurate representation, but it is in a way, it represents uh, the decay of a performer's memory, which is really interesting to me. Because I had been thinking about like audiences before and like, trying to interview like hardcore connoisseurs. And then I was like, oh, actually, this is, this is um, a different experience of that piece through the very people who performed it, right? That's when life's at its best, like, <laughs> you know, you know. Well, that's kind of what happens when you watch it. Yeah, it's exactly what happens. Yeah, I, I actually, I was like, it would be really funny to have them direct the piece now from their memory, but yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you.